lost in him tonight.
You've been merciful to me, O oh Lord. You've been merciful to me, Lord, just to let me live one more day. I love to be in your presence, oh my Father, to worship you. Oh, love of my soul, oh, love of my soul, I love to praise you. I long to see you. Let my eyes stay clearly on you, Lord. Oh, help me, Lord, to never be distracted from you. You're the one that my soul desires. You're the only true meaning of life. Oh, my Savior. Oh, my love. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Oh, lover of my soul. One that my heart desires, the one that's the light of my eyes, the one that causes my heart to sing with rapture and with delight. When I look into your love, O oh Lord, and you're reaching for me. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Oh, come on, somebody. Worship him. He's here. Worship him. He's here.
Jesus. Stay in the spirit of worship. I want to sing another song, but I feel like I should. I've never done this, Pastor, so I just feel like I should pray a prayer that my heart seems to be praying to the Lord right now. I want to talk to my beloved. I want to talk to the one who my heart stirs for. I want to say to my beloved tonight how my heart is hungered for you. How my heart is yearned for you. But I felt that I was so unclean and unworthy of you. And my heart has been distracted by so many things. And I've allowed so many things to pull me away from your gaze, my beloved. But I hear you. I hear the footsteps of my beloved coming. And my heart is awakened. My heart is awakened and burns within me because I feel you near. How my heart yearns for you, O oh Lord. You're my desire. You're the one that I want, Lord. You're the one that I want. You're the one that I want. You're the one. You're the one who found me. You're the one who dressed me. You're the one who cleaned me up. And my gaze is fixed upon you because I feel you near. And I reach to you and tell you I love you. My heart tells of its love for you and its hunger for you. Oh, my beloved. Lift up your voice to him. Come on, tell him if you love for him. He's here. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him. <laughs> tell him. Tell him.
Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your embrace. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face. Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your embrace. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face. Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your embrace. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face. Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Let me feel your Smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch. You see your lovely face. Take me away. Sing to him. Let me know the kisses of your mouth. Sing to the Lord. Let me know the kisses of Let me feel your embrace. Let me feel your embrace. Let me smell the fragrance of your touch. Let me see your lovely face. Take me away with you.
The golden, the glorious bride, and the great son of man, and every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the land. We will dance, sing, we will dance on the streets that had a gold, the glorious bride, and the great son of man. Every tongue and tribe and nation will talk oh. in the song of the land. And the Lord says, your worship has come up before me as a sweet-smelling savor. And I am pleased with your worship. And I long for you, the Lord says. And I desire to see you. And I, even the night, I stir your heart with passion for me. Because I long for you desi to desire me more than anything else. More than ministry. More than church. More than family. More than friends. I long for my children to look into my face and hunger after me. Even now, my heart is prepared for our meeting. I only await the voice of the Father. I only await the voice of the Father. I'm stirring your heart, says the Lord, with a passion for me because I could not come for you in the shape that you have been in. And the Lord says to you tonight to cleanse the garment, make it spotless, iron out imperfections, allow the Spirit of the Lord to begin to wash all the imperfections out and fill up your lamp with oil and trim your lamp and get it prepared because behold, the bridegroom is soon to come, is soon to come, is soon to come, is soon to come. And the Lord says in the days that are ahead, you will see things beginning to shake around you and you will see many people begin to shake to their foundations. And you will see many people begin to fall off. But the Lord says, it's a holy shaking that I'm sending. And I'm sending it not, not to make it difficult for my bride, but to make it difficult for those that would like to just ride the fence and hang on. I, the Lord, am calling for a bride that has made herself ready, that has cleanse the garment that has prepared herself for my meeting with her. I, the Lord, am coming for a church that is not weak, that is not distracted, but one that is focused upon me completely and whose heart is completely mine. 
And the Lord says, even this night, I'm dealing with those of you that have been just hanging on. And there are those of you tonight here, the Lord says, that upon coming into this place, you said just a few days prior, Lord, I seem to be just hanging on by a thread. The Lord says, get a hold of me. Get a hold of me. Get a hold of me. Let go, the Lord says, of the hem of the garment and grab hold of my hand. Grab hold of me, for I will sustain you and I will lift you up and I will bring to pass those prophecies and those things that have been spoken over you and those things that you've long since given up. The Lord says, I'm reviving them in you. Right this minute, I'm reviving them in you. Rise up, men of God. 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 Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Awake out of sleep, arise. The Lord says, oh my, <laughs> this is good, glory. <laughs> the things that have befallen you in your life, to take no thought for the age you are, because there are folks here tonight who are saying, Lord, I was young and now I'm old. And what you said that you would do in my life, you've not yet done. And you began to give up on the Lord. Lord says, I don't work the way you want me to work. And I have not forgotten. And I haven't lost your address. Surely the Lord is able to bring to pass those things that he said and that he promised because he is the Lord. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. Woo!
just lift your hands and begin to love him. He's coming again. There's such an expectancy here tonight that it wouldn't surprise me to see Jesus show up right now. Amen. Are you ready to go tonight? I am. This world has nothing to offer. No more. Come quickly, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. I know it was going to be good because Tuesday night prayer meeting was just like this the whole night. How many were here? How many know that? Amen. Oh. We're trying to get some tapes done, and I was, I was looking at a tape that uh, we had done back in October 1995, four months into the revival. That's when Linda looked younger, Pastor looked younger. I'm telling you, you all look really younger. And, and, and as I, I was writing some things about uh, a description of that, I, I thought about, you know, the dating time is over. We've dated Jesus long enough. Amen. This on again, off again relationship, folks, it's over. He's calling us into his presence now more than he has ever before. And friends, something's getting ready to happen. <laughs> I come in here every night, and it's almost like, Lord, is this tonight the night we're all going to be in your presence? Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But I was looking at that video, and that was some uh, 14 or 15 or so months ago, and I was so amazed at how closer we have come to Jesus. This revival has brought, I don't know about you, but it has brought so many thousands of people into his presence. And it was like Brother Linda was saying, I know that was right direct from, from the Lord when he said, the garment's being prepared. The satin gown of the bride is being pressed out now. No more wrinkles, no more spots, no more blemishes. It's just Jesus, the bridegroom. Amen. How many are glad to be the bride tonight? Say amen. Lord, we thank you for this wedding feast that's about to take place, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that our names are written in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that the devil knows who we are. Devil, it's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Oh, Jesus. Well, I tell you, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about it. I just feel something inside. I don't I don't know where this thing's going to go tonight, <laughs> but it's just a, just a vibration going on inside of me right now. Whew. 
Anybody feel that presence? This is awesome, man. Whew. My Lord. Do you want to stay away from this corner here? <laughs> There's an anointing on the corner of this, of this podium here. You just don't get around that. But anyway, God bless you. You can be seated. So wonderful to be in the presence of God's people. Isn't it going to be great when we get to heaven? We don't have to worry about the world anymore. All we can do is sit at his feet and love him. How many love the foot ministry of Jesus? I do. Just sitting at his feet, not asking for anything, but just loving him. If anything has happened in this revival, it's taught me two things. How to sit, how to listen, and how to love Jesus. You know, so many times we've, we've become so spoiled in this environment of what we call the church that we believe that all we have to do is ask and ask and ask and ask. But you know, there's times that, that Jesus wants us just to sit at his feet. Just to sit at his feet. Sometimes in the morning I wake up and I just sit quietly and it's like I'm sitting at his feet. And I've heard him say in, 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 in a small, still voice to my heart many times, what do you want today? And I say, nothing, Jesus, but to sit at your feet and just love you. That's all. You know, one of the opportunities that we have in, 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 in this relationship with the Lord and covenant relationship is, is being able to give. That has turned my life around in this revival, this thing about being able to give. I want God to bless me for one purpose. I just love to give. I have fallen in love with being able to give. And you know, part of this revival, if you go back to the nation of Israel, talks about the glory of God. Glory of God, kevod, is the heaviness of God. And he said he would weight us down with his benefits. And when, they, when the nations looked at Israel, their, their glory was also manifested in the possessions that they had. It's almost like everything that they touched turned to a blessing. And they could choose blessing or they could choose cursing, whichever one they wanted to choose. And my heart for the Christian today is that if you learn how to give... I mean truly, not give because you're asked to give, but just give and give and give. And I guess it's something that Evangelist Steve Hill said some months ago about, um, who was it? John Wesley, I think it was, that you said that he gave the, every, every financial blessing, whatever the, he, whenever he got money, he gave it away so it didn't stick to him, so it wouldn't find a place in his heart. You know, you'd be surprised. We were just talking. Everywhere we go, it's just, it's just become a time of just talking about the Lord. I guess people, people look at me like I'm a fanatic. No, I'm normal. And we were talking to some people today that were Christians, and you know they're backslidden. But they were asking more about the revival. They thought all of you people were lining up outside just to get into a class. I said, no. I said, they're lined up at 6 o'clock in the morning to get in the, in the, in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock that night. They said, really? Just to get in church? And you know, come to find, amen, amen. This is what, give the Lord a praise, man. This is awesome what God is doing. Awesome. And come to find out, she said, well, I used to be in the assemblies of God and I didn't go any further. You knew right away they were backslidden. But you know, what God gives to us is such an opportunity. You know, it's almost like, you know, we've talked about that, that, that they're going to be building a new building. In fact, we broke ground several Sundays ago for the new building and it's going to cost about $3 million to build that building. Friends, that's nothing. Several weeks ago, I was in Virginia Beach, and they're, they're just completing a $20 million sanctuary. $3 million is nothing. And, you know, I, I thought about that. Well, 3,000 people to give $100,000. Yeah, right, that would be good. 3,000 people to give $1,000. But you know what I look at it? Man, there are only about 2,400 spots left. I mean, that's the way I look at it. It's not, oh, man, look at the mount. It's just looking at it and say, wow, I've only got 2,400. I better hurry up and do something before they're all gone. And so we encourage you tonight, if you, if you would like to sow into that, into, in, into what we're doing over there, it's not for man. And, and, and you know, Tuesday nights we come in here and, we, and, and we, the, the prayer time has just gotten so awesome. And, and one of the things is we pray for all of the, uh, uh, all of the uh, money containers. Or what do you, I don't like the word bags. But anyway, that's what they are. And, and, and we pray for them that, that God would bless. And God has so blessed this revival. It's almost, Lord, give me a chance to give some more. 
Because, friends, every time a soul comes to this altar, it's like I told the people Tuesday night in intercessory prayer, every time a soul comes to this altar, you're looking at a miracle. It's not a natural thing for the Adamic nature of man to want to live righteous. But when you see someone come to this altar, they're touched and their lives are changed. I've been here for a long enough period, almost 20 months now, to see lives that are changed. I see a lot of the same faces coming back over and over and over again. They were into drugs, prostitutes, all kinds. You, you name them, they've been to these altars. But their lives have been radically changed. Friends, there is a lot of, uh, of flack that you can pick up if, that's, if, if it's the negative that you want to find out about this revival. But these people have never been to revival. They haven't seen the changes in these lives. Friends, when you can change a, a man or a woman from the course of, of sin and unrighteousness and God touches their heart and changes them and they begin to seek him just like you were little, a little while ago, it was, just, it was just like a love session with Jesus. How many felt that? Just like loving Jesus. He's so precious. And so we're just going to offer you an opportunity tonight to sow into what God is doing. Friends, we could talk for hours about what God is doing. But you know... The thing that I said several weeks ago to someone, and it just clicked, and then they, I said, they said, what's going on at Brownsville? And I just said, lasting fruit. Lasting fruit. Not just something that's here tonight and, and a move of emotions, and then they disappear. No, it is lasting fruit, friends, and it's beginning to take hold all across this nation. And so if you'd like to have part in what God is doing, we're going to take up an offering now if the ushers will come forward. And if you're from another church, please do not curse us with your tithe. Isn't it interesting? Only 10% we don't have control of. 10% we do not have control of in all that God gives us. And even singing the song a little while ago, God is, is good. 10% we don't have control of because that goes to your church. But isn't it wonderful that God gives us 90% that we can have control of, that we can glorify him and we can give where, where he asks us to give? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't want to make a theology out of this, but when I get to heaven, I expect I'll either be able to sing at least as well as Lendl does, or else that all of our hearing will be such that there's no such thing as being on key and off key. <laughs> or it's wonderful to worship the Lord and to celebrate his goodness. I first went to India in 1993. I see some brothers and sisters from India here tonight, and, and you go to a lot of different countries, and you normally have a certain expectation, and things never quite live up to the expectation. When we got to India, we were amazed because it was everything we expected and beyond. It was a very different world for us. The quality of the Christianity that we, we experienced was tremendous, but all the different players that we thought would be there were there, if you know what I mean. I mean, there, there were the, the terribly poor and the suffering people on the streets, and there were the, the Hindu holy men begging and, and all the different things and, and the pure-hearted, zealous Christians. And I remember just being amazed that everything I expected was just kind of playing itself out. And, you know, for years, some of us have prayed for revival and read about revival and talked about revival and experienced different degrees of a reviving presence of God. And we have always known that when God really came in revival power, that certain things would happen, that all the players would just play their roles, that everything would be a certain way. And it's amazing to be living it out right now. It's amazing to be in the midst of it. A few years ago, God moved on me to write one book to prepare people for revival, to remove the roadblocks to revival. And I knew that as God began to move, that there'd be two great obstacles for revival. As people were in the midst of renewal and blessing, that there'd be two great obstacles for real revival. And that they'd happen in the past, they'd happen today just like they happened in the past. And, and one was that there'd be the religious, critical spirit, traditional, small-minded spirit that would stand in the way of any new thing, sometimes out of jealousy and envy and competition and pride and security. Sometimes just not like anything new. Sometimes the fire was too hot and people like it the old way. People like it in the dark where their sin's not exposed when the light starts shining, they don't like it. There are many reasons why revival's rejected. If you read through the Gospels and Acts and see the religious resistance that Jesus and the apostles had, you'll see that in true revival, it's similar. 
And then on the other side of it, the exact opposite roadblock would be a superficial sensationalism, a craze with manifestations and outward things. People just wanted to bless me, bless me, bless me kind of mentality and not being hungry for holiness and hungry for the harvest. And as we've seen the move of God increase and intensify in recent years, and now we are in the midst of genuine revival, we see these two things just rising, just as expected. And something struck me today. I was talking to the students in our school of ministry, and I asked the question, why is it that the Pharisees said that Jesus was demon-possessed? Why something so extreme? Why not just say he's, he's not teaching accurately? Or we have some disagreements with him on particular points. Or we question how he's doing things. No, they said he's demon-possessed. In fact, they tried to kill him. Strange, isn't it? Why did they say he was demon-possessed? I believe a key reason is this. What he was doing was so supernatural. What he was doing was so undeniably miraculous. What he was doing was having such a huge impact, they either had to bow the knee, they had to get off the religious high horse, they had to, their authority, their very place in society was threatened. After all, fishermen and tax collectors of this guy's disciples, who were they? We didn't ordain them, we didn't recognize, who were they? They're threatening our power. They're threatening our influence. Of course, power and influence also generate money. That can be a factor too. But either they had to bow the knee and say, this is God, because it was so large and so supernatural, or they had to harden their heart to the point of saying, he's demon-possessed. Friends, you're about to see the exact same things play themselves out in front of your eyes. This is nothing new. You could read things we wrote years ago, and we're saying the exact same thing. When real revival comes, it's going to happen. Now look, if you're being used by God, you always have a teachable spirit. You always have a humble spirit. You always prove that you're a person who loves to submit to authority. You always have an open ear to correction. Because none of us are perfect and none of us have it all. But friends, when you know that you know you're in the center of the will of God, when you know that you know that you're pursuing Him heart and soul, when you know that you know He's pouring out His Spirit, don't dare let anybody stop you, friends. Don't let anybody steal your crown. Don't let anybody paralyze you. Don't let anybody slow you down. Friends, some of you sitting here, I'm telling you this. Back in July, we, we told the congregation, such and such junk's going to be said about, about this congregation, about this move of God in the future. And of course, people say it. I'm telling you that some of you sitting here will be called demon-possessed by other Christians that you have known for years. Write it down. Write it down. Some of you are going to be rejected in the strongest possible terms by people that used to walk with you in the Lord. Pity them, friends. Pray for them. Pray that God would open their eyes. Because in order to get to that point, they've had to grieve the Spirit. They've had to sin against the Spirit. They've had to harden their hearts. And we need to pray for them. Listen, it's not a matter of doing it our way or this way, that way. God's building a big church, friends. There are things he's doing around the world. The reason I know we're in the midst of genuine revival is because this is one of many things he's doing around the world. A few years ago when I saw God moving, I said, look at this. It's happening in Pentecostal circles. Wait, it's happening in charismatic circles. Wait, it's happening in Baptist circles. Wait, it's happening on college campuses. When it's happening in this country, that, that's one of the great signs of revival. God's moving, friend. Don't try and put him in your little narrow box or my narrow box. Don't try and duplicate everything you see. Say, God, however you want to do it, whatever the cost, whatever the consequences, send the fire of revival in my day, in my life, now. I want to invite every leader that is here, all of you in ministry, spouses of people in ministry, pastoral staff, leadership, those in training for ministry, if you're in active ministry or leadership, I want to encourage all of you to be here at our 11 o'clock session tomorrow. I'm going to be talking about cooperating with the Holy Spirit. It's a, a strong word in my heart, the things that grieve the Spirit and the ways to work with the Holy Spirit in the midst of revival. It's a critically important message, so be here at 11 tomorrow. Also at 10 o'clock over in the chapel, 
Brother Richard Crisco, our youth pastor, will meet with those in youth ministry that want to find out more about what God's doing in youth revival. You might say, well, I don't see that many young people here. That's because it's Thursday night youth service. We've got the chapel packed. We may have as many as 1,200 kids in there tonight going after God. You haven't heard this yet. You know, I gave you the report from Chicago. How, how many of you were here last night when I talked about 145 kids that came down from Chicago teens? Steve said they knew they were coming to revival, but most all of them weren't walking with the Lord and never knew the Lord. Well, they went to a youth service at one of the churches where some of the kids went. Now, I'm just giving you the numbers that were reported to us. In the past, they had 125 kids in the youth meeting. God knows where they came from, but the youth meeting they had last night, according to the report, there were 400 kids that showed up in this church. And they began to testify what happened to them. Now, there, there's, this is from the brother that was responsible for bringing them down, the brother, with one of our, uh, the brother of one of our students in our school of ministry here. He's reporting that as the kids began to testify, I said, all right, I know that one, I know that one. Who's that? He, he didn't come down to Brownsville. Who's that? He didn't come down. One of the kids testifies that in his high school, a kid comes up to him. I guess yesterday or the day before, a kid comes up to him and says, I want what you have. And he lays hands on him right in the school. The power of God hits this unsafe kid, falls to the ground. Now this kid's changed. He's publicly testifying to what God did, man. God's at work. So if you're in youth ministry, if you're a youth pastor and want to meet with Brother Richard tomorrow to find out some aspects of the youth ministry here, that's 10 o'clock in the chapel. Then when you're done, join us in here. And then Pastor Van Lane, who's involved uh, in the children's ministry here, he heads that up. There are awesome things happening among the kids, little kids. Sometimes you, you watch and you say, is this really God? Could this really be God? Could this be the real revival? And then you see what's happening to the kids and you say, my God, this is it. This is real. So all those in children's ministry are invited to meet with Pastor Van Lane in the children's chapel, also at 10. And then you can join us when you're done there. And 11 o'clock, we'll all be gathering here for that session. Also, make sure you get information in our school of ministry on the way out and uh, info on our summer courses that we've specially designed so many of you can come to them. Now, I want you to stand to your feet and please listen carefully. Everybody stand up. I know Steve real well and I know when something is burning in his heart in an unusual way. His heart's always burning, but some nights it's burning more intensely than others. This is one of those nights. He has a word from the Lord for you. We're going to take a break about seven minutes, okay? But keep an eye on your watch. Keep yourself in a good holy frame of mind because there's a word from God that's about to be spoken to us. So don't just chill out and hang out and come back in 20 minutes. Get right back in here. We'll take a short break, about seven minutes, and then we'll hear the word. God bless you. To change this nation. And I'm also believing, we're hearing reports are coming in from all over this nation of pastors. There's a pastor here tonight. He said he's had 3,000 people saved in the last month. They're seeing things happen. Yes. We believe this is the year of the favor of the Lord. This is the year where the Lord, I mean, think about it, friend, as it was in the days of Noah. You remember, the world was wicked, but God looked down and he found a man. You need to determine tonight that you're going to be God's Noah. I'm going to be the one, Jesus, you can count on me. I'll fight, I'll build, I'll do whatever you want me to do, Jesus, but count me in on this end time harvest. Count me in, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, this is the end. Sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you 
Because he has anointed you to preach good news. He has sent you to the poor. This is my To bind up the broken hearted. This is my To bring freedom to the captives. Anointed us. He has anointed us to
Glory. Yes. Hallelujah. He's an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you. We bless you. Hallelujah. For those of you, for those of you visiting for the first time tonight, you came to check the revival out. Just keep in mind, we've been here since Father's Day of 1995. You just slipped in a couple hours ago. We've seen things. I learned a long time ago, until you walked in another man's shoes, until you've been there, until you've been there, friend, we've seen some stuff. What Dick Rubin was sharing a few minutes ago about, I can look across this congregation and go over to the youth meeting and see young people worshiping God. And I remember 13 months ago when that young person came down to these altars and I turned to pastor and I said, look at that guy. Because he was just ripped up, ripped to shreds by Satan and his demons of hell and drugs were all over him, alcohol, so there's this the stench of the streets was on his breath and his clothes. And now, 13 months later, worshiping God. Friend, we've seen some stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah! We are... We are extremely emotional here. We do not apologize for that. Extremely emotional. Jesus Christ has set us free. One of the things he set a lot of us free, I want everyone to listen up before you're seated. One of the greatest deliverances we've had in this revival has not been crack, cocaine, or alcohol addiction, or pornography, or any other type of drugs or vices. One of the greatest deliverances we've seen here is a mighty deliverance from criticism, from a critical spirit. And friend, you, if you, you may think kicking morphine, and I've been, I've been on hard drugs. I was on them for years. You may think it's hard to kick those drugs. It was, but it ain't nothing like kicking criticism. A critical spirit will get inside of you, and criti critical people, critical people are like drug addicts. They have to hang around other critical people to get their fix. They go, talk to me, man, I got, I'm, I'm hungry. 
talk to me. Make sure I'm, what I'm talking about is the truth. I, you know, I want to make sure my criticism up, is, is up to date now. And so they feed one another. And when you get free from that, you're free indeed, friend. It's well. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know how this got in the Alabama Baptist magazine. <laughs> but there is a powerful, art. this is April 10th. Matter of fact, this came out today, Baptist. And it is two thirds of the page all about the Pensacola revival. <laughs> how many friends? powerful. God bless you, Baptist. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want everyone in the chapel, in the choir room, in the cafeteria, on this main, in this main auditorium, those of you at home, to pray this prayer. We've been praying since Father's Day. We've been asking the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Friend, we, we stand on this platform, Lyndall Cooley, myself, John Kilpatrick, all of us, Kerry Robinson, Michael Brown, Dick Rubin, humble every night. We're humbled at what God's doing. It is phenomenal. And every night we pray the same prayer, Lord, speak to my heart, change my life. Because nobody has a handle on God. And if you think you got a handle on God, I want to ask you, is your shadow healing the sick? Do you wake up in the morning and look out and you're drinking your Folgers and go, dear God, honey, there they are again. And there's a line of people outside your house because the sun just rose. And they know you're fixing to, they know you're fixing to walk down the sidewalk to get the morning paper. And they line up and down the sidewalk when you get your morning paper so your shadow will fall over them. If that's not happening to you, then maybe you need more of God. So nobody, nobody has a handle on God. He's been free. And by the way, those of you that say put God in a box, I used to say that. We used to put God in a box. You're the one in the box. God has never been in a box. Well, you need to let him out of your box. Think about that. You're the one in the box. You're the one all closed in. He's been free as a bird. He's the one that left a long time ago. He wasn't inside your box. So I want everyone here to pray the same prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. Jesus, speak to my heart, change my life. Everyone together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart, change my life. Change my life. In, your name, In your precious name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, in a couple minutes, Charity, is going to be singing Run to the Mercy Seat. We're going to give you the opportunity to get right with God. I want everyone, listen to me, folks. Do not let anyone distract you tonight. Don't let anything distract you. If you have someone with you that's unsaved, that just wants to talk for a few minutes, tell them no. Don't talk to me right now. If somebody's discussing to you where you're going to eat after the revival meeting, there's only a couple restaurants open anyway. So it's either, it's either Whataburger, Krispy Kreme, or, or Shoney's. Crystal, of which every one of those restaurants should tithe to this revival. People ask us all the time, how has this revival affected the community? We've seen thousands saved in Pensacola. But you talk to some of the businesses around here, they go, revival? Yeah. <laughs> we love that revival. <laughs> I'll never forget when somebody came in with the National Rent-A-Car. Those of you that rent with National, they, they, um, they came and they gave me a map. And National Rent-A-Car, you know, they print maps from the National Office, you know, on how to get around the, the countryside. And, and National Rent-A-Car was so sick and tired of telling everybody how to get to the church. And where Brownsville was, they had this map, and it, it came from the National Office, and it, it showed Pensacola. Brownsville is only a suburb-like thing of Pensacola, okay? But it showed Pensacola, big star, and then Brownsville, real big, right next to it. <laughs> so
So National Rent-A-Car, hear me well. Make your checks payable to Brownsville Assembly of God. <laughs> Building project. You want to rent more cars? Help us get that building up. I know that's strictly carnal, but get over it, friend. Let me tell you. I am, a, I am a missionary evangelist, and I got over that spirit stuff a long time ago. You know, well, let's just pray the money in, you know? This is 1997. I pray, okay? But if you'll take a look at a checkbook, try it sometime, any checkbook, watch where the money goes. Just read it. You know, it'll go, it'll go, $10, missions project, $70, Gafer's new dress. You know? Read on down. $62, Bennigan's restaurant. $276, tickets, Disney World. You just go on down the list. And then people complain. Dear God, get off it, friend. This is 1997. And it's time for people to speak about finances. I mean, there's nothing wrong with giving, friend. And this, this building that's going up, we're not here promoting this building or anything. This is just going to be a family life center. But we're in a pickle on this revival because we're not moving off this campus because people are getting saved in a church, and that's important. They've asked us, why don't we use the Civic Center? Well, if you use the Civic Center, that's where all the rock concerts are. That's where everything else is. But when people come here and young people give their lives to the Lord in a church, we're finding that it sticks. I'm not against Civic Centers. Don't get me wrong, but this is what God's spoken to us about here. This Family Life Center is going to help us handle 2,500 more people. And we've been here nights. There's maybe this week the tent is set up. And uh, we've, we've had, last week, we probably had six or 7,000 people on this campus. And so it's going to help us. And so we make no apologies. And I want to tell you something about the Brownsville Church. This congregation is strong. They're a healthy church. And they have given until it hurts to promote this revival. As far as promotion, make sure that the bills are paid. They love this revival, friend. And they're here working all the time, and so we don't make any apologies for asking for finances for the bill. If you got a problem with that, take it up with God. But anyway, I don't know who that was for, but you deserve it. <laughs> Early this morning, the Lord began speaking to me about tonight's message. I want everyone to listen. I want you to give me your undivided attention right now because this is going to be quick, to the point. This is a word from the Lord. This is not my message. My message is coming in about five minutes. Alone in my study, his word became crystal clear. He shared with me of how in the days ahead he will be turning up the heat. Now, I woke up this morning, friend, trembling. And when I wake up trembling, and the Lord says, get into your study and write now, I obey him, and this is what he said. He will be turning up the heat. He will cause people to make up their minds. Confrontation will be the buzzword. The unbelievers will be confronted concerning their walk with him. Do they or do they not accept him as personal savior? Do they accept him not only as Savior, but also as Lord? Or are they accepting just what one might call partial redemption? I want to go to heaven, but I still want to sin. The Lord is drawing the line. He is laying down the law, saying clearly to the unbeliever, this is the way, walk ye in it, choose you this day, who you're going to serve. He spoke to me early this morning of the commotion being stirred up among his people. I must bring my church, the Lord said early this morning, to a boiling point. <laughs> I must bring my church to a boiling point. I will turn up the heat. The impurities will be destroyed. When the heat is turned up, many self-righteous will fall away. I will no longer permit, saith the Lord, arrogance, conceit, and those who lie 
to function freely. They will be dealt with by my spirit. Some who are teachable will be dealt with lovingly. Others will receive due punishment. My rod of correction will come down clearly to bring about change. Should they choose to rebel, should they choose to continue in adamant denial of what I am doing, then a separation will occur. They will operate with a form of godliness, but my power will not be with them. Behold, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. Speak to them tonight concerning my ways. I will not and have never tolerated pride. Behold, my word declares that I resist the proud. Let it be made known that the proud, the cold, the calloused, the critical, and the arrogant will have no place at my table. I will not permit the division of my true church. However, the severing of those who might say they are of my church will be seen by all. Yes, I am bringing a sword. Welcome the blade. It is sharp, it is polished, its cut is clean. I am a master marksman. I can sever from the body exactly what needs to be cut off without bringing the smallest cut to my people. Do not be afraid. This is my preparation for my final harvest. I will plow up the soil. I will remove the rocks. I will disturb the ground. I will plant my seed. I will water my seed. I will watch it grow. I will pull the weeds. I will harvest a crop and I will eat of the fruit. This is my work. I am the Lord of the harvest and I will accomplish my purpose in the days ahead. Do not be alarmed, saith the Lord. Do not be moved. Do not try to redeem those who fall away. They must come back on my terms. I'm going to say that again because some of you missed it. And those of you that are watching from another city or another country, pay attention. And sir, you had better because the very thing that you are listening to will come to pass in your life. Do not be alarmed, church. Do not be moved. Do not try to redeem those who fall away. They must come back on my terms. They must repent, not bargain. They must plead for forgiveness. I will not negotiate. They must become white hot for what I am doing, not white hot for what they think I should be doing. Warn them, for I the Lord have spoken. I will dry up their streams and cause famine in their land. I am moving and they must move with me. Do not be stubborn, remain pliable. When the cloud moves, move with the cloud. When the fire takes a turn, move with the fire. I am doing a work in these days that your fathers dreamed of. I am preparing my bride. My coming is soon. The days are numbered. Fill your lamps. The bridegroom cometh. We welcome you. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Now, some of you did not understand that because you're not a Christian. You don't understand that. But you will by the time this meeting is up. In a few minutes, by the time I finish, you're going to understand really what the presence of the Lord is all about. Mike, bring that to me, what you read to me a few minutes ago about a book you wrote, what, 10 years ago, 8 years ago? Whew, something's happening. Woo, friend. People ask me all the time about the Argentine revival. One of the things I loved about the Argentine revival was, was, was agitation. Everything was always stirring. Nothing ever settled. 
people, Christians were always fighting back and forth saying, is that God? Is it not? Sinners were always repenting. People were being saved by the thousands. It was nonstop every day all over Argentina and still goes on to this day. I love that. I love it. Just a constant movement. It'll keep you from slumbering, Pastor. This was written probably eight years ago by Michael Brown. It is true that revival brings division and persecution. It is true that it brings reproach and misunderstanding, and not all of this is the Spirit's doing. Sometimes people get carried away with fleshly displays. Other times, demonic counterfeits are passed off for the real thing. No revival is perfect. It comes through imperfect man. John Wesley said, Lord, send us a revival without any defects. But if that's not possible, send us a revival, defects and all. Whew. Give John Wesley a hand tonight. I can just see him up there right now. Some angel just turned to John and went, they're quoting you again. Whew. Oh, Whitfield's going, why don't they quote me more often? They don't, I always quote Wesley, Wesley, Wesley. But putting the flesh aside and eliminating all satanic manifestations, true revival will always bring division. It divides the hot from the cold and the serious from the superficial. For some it is life, for others death. For some it is peace, for others a sword. Revival leaves no middle ground. Well, If I have ever known in these meetings whether or not I'm supposed to preach on something, it's tonight. The Lord gave me this this morning, and uh, people ask me where the messages come from. They come from the Lord, and it has to be God, friend, because we live beat. There's no time, you know, to... I didn't come here with 572 messages, you know, under my belt. I was a traveling evangelist. I had five. And those of you theologians here that believe everybody should prepare a message for three days, I believe that too when you can do it. But try preaching a revival, friend, when it's absolutely, positively impossible to do that. It just don't work. You're going to have to change your philosophy, friend, when revival breaks out. Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read several scriptures tonight. This is entitled The Great Divide. Ooh-wee. He's in the house. For those of you, yeah, somebody said he better be. It's his house. <laughs> I love that. He's here, and he's always welcome, and he can do anything he wants. You can go in any room. Verse 49, I'm going to read several passages, but this is Luke chapter 12, 49 through 53. Stay with me just for a couple minutes as we read the scripture. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how, how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Verse 51, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. From now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Turn with me now to John 7. I want you to see a little pattern here. By the way, those were the words of Jesus. Some of you are going to have a hard time with this stuff. But it's Scripture. Verse 37 of John 7. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Verse 40. Some of the multitude, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Christ. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? 
So there arose a division in the multitude because of him. And some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers therefore came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why do you not bring him? The officers answered, Never did a man speak the way this man speaks. Can you see the commotion here, friend? These people were messed up. Everywhere Jesus went, he messed up the crowd. He could walk into a perfectly normal situation and leave chaos. Every funeral he went to, he foiled. People were all happily mourning away, and then Jesus shows up. Spent all that money on flowers, went out and knitted a black dress and everything, and Jesus had to come along and raise a person from the dead. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he messed things up. Verse 47, the Pharisees therefore answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers of the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this multitude which does not know the law is a curse. Nicodemus said to them, he who came to him before being one of them, you remember the story in John 3, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? That'd be a good scripture for many of you to take to heart. Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered and said to him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And everyone went to his home. Turn with me now to John 9, verse 16. We're going to read several scriptures. Stay with me. Therefore, some of the Pharisees, you know this story about Jesus healing the blind man. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Now flip over to John 10, 19 and 21. This was after Jesus said, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. This is what took place. Verse 19, there arose a division again among the Jews because of these words. And many of them were saying, he has a demon. Mike just shared on that. And is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? I love this stuff, Fred. You know what that is? Están chocando. Those of you from... Yeah, Gloria a Dios! <laughs> we got some Spanish folks here tonight. It's un choque. That's a, that's a crash. They're crashing. They're button heads. That's what revival will do, friend. People are going to butt heads. They're going to say, wait a minute. That ain't God. That is God. That ain't God. Wait a minute. The devil can't heal a man on crack cocaine. The devil's not going to take a man off crack cocaine and put him into Bible school. And others are saying, it can't be God. People aren't supposed to fall backwards. People aren't supposed to shake. People aren't supposed to do this. They're not supposed to. Where is it in the scripture? Friend, look at me, folks. Listen, I'm going to put you to the, the test right now. Walk, up to, walk back in time 2,000 years and walk up to Saul of Tarsus right after his conversion. Walk up to him, friend. Look in his face and say, scales fell from your eyes. Show me that in Scripture. Saul was learned. He was educated. Wasn't he, wasn't he educated on a Gamaliel? He was an individual. He was learned. He knew. Friend, the Bible doesn't say it. And Saul went off and searched the Scripture for 18 years to find out where those scales were from. No, friend. It was a conversion experience. It was real. Some are so naive, friend. All shook up over a little shaking, Mike Brown says. All shook up. Man's hand shakes like this. And rather than hear the service, rather than sit in here and enjoy the move of God, they spend the whole night in their car out in the parking lot looking up 
Right, 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 right. Hand, 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 hand. Shake, shake, shake. Shake. Maybe, maybe that hand that's shaking used to slap his kids. Maybe that hand that's shaking used to run needles. The other day I was sitting in that seat where Brother Wetzel's sitting. This never happened to me before. I sat there and my hand started vibrating out of control. And I went, this is strange. And I tried to stop it. And I stopped it for a second, then it just started popping, just started shaking. And then I remembered as I was sitting there, this hand right here used to hold needles. And I used to pump them in my veins. Just so, it used to be so anti-God. It never worshiped, it would fight. This hand was so rebellious. This hand picked up a frying pan one time and threw it at my sister trying to kill her in a drunken stupor one day. This hand was violent. I was going, God, whatever you want to do with this hand. Whatever you want to do with this whole body. Shoot. Whatever you want to do. Hallelujah. Woo. Well, there are too many scriptures tonight. I want you to turn one more. Matthew 10. I'm staying mainly in the teachings of Jesus, but you move into the early church, friend. There was some stuff that went on. One of the things I'm praying for, and one man came up to me and asked me one night, he said, are you seriously about this? I said, yeah, I am, seriously praying. I'm asking for God once again to come down in power the way he did in the early church. I'm asking for Ananias and Sapphira experiences in every denomination. I'm asking God when a politician stands up in front of our nation in the Southeast, and because it's part of the Bible Belt, he says, my family and I go, were faithful to First Baptist. But then he'll go out west to San Francisco in the gay community and say, we need to open up the gates for all of you to do whatever you please. God understands your sexual preference. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to get to the place in this nation where the Lord goes, hmm, Father, it really established the early church. Fear spread throughout the land. And Lord, people would see the pattern in America. They would see, wait a minute, that man right there stood in front of everybody and we know the lifestyle he was living and he said this about you, Jesus. He said he was living for you. Everyone knew he wasn't and he had a heart attack. This man on the West Coast was basically saying the same thing, saying he was born again on fire for God, all this kind of stuff, and he had a heart attack. This woman down in South Texas who was running for mayor, was running for this, running for that, when she was speaking to the Christian group, was all pro-Jesus, everything. But then when she went across to the lesbians and spoke at their conference, she changed her whole tune, and she had a heart attack. Hum. Maybe there will be a politician's conference, and that will be number one on the list of things to discuss, is um, it would be best... If you're going to call yourself a Christian, then live like a Christian. Yeah. Woo. One more, Matthew chapter 10, 32. Everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now remember, he came to bring a sword. Don't forget this about a sword. A sword 
is an instrument of war. Don't forget these points, friend. I'm moving on. A sword is not for decoration. It's used for cutting or thrusting through. Also remember that a sword is a very personal weapon. It is effective only in the hand-to-hand combat. There is a sword in the Lord's hands. This is the great divide. When the Lord begins moving mightily in your life, there's a great divide. You will see it beginning take, to take place. It is a great separation, for those of you that are being lost by the word divide. It is a great separation. Several areas we're going to discuss, just three of them tonight, then we're going to move into the altar call. This great divide is obvious to everyone. I want to share with you for the next few minutes a few areas where this division is taking place. You can call these places cut marks. These are the points where the sword came down. I've seen them in my own life, and I've seen them in others. And the Lord knows how many times we've seen his swordsmanship here in the revival. He's come down, friend. The first point tonight. I'm going to move quickly. I don't have a lot of notes, friend. It's not real deep, but it's clear. And sometimes clear is very deep. Mark Twain used to say, it's not the scriptures that I don't understand that bother me. It's the scriptures I do understand. (laughs) And I read to you enough tonight, friend, for you to get some type of an idea that the Lord's doing something. He's not going to put up with junk. He comes in dividing, clearing out the garbage. Number one, when Jesus Christ begins to move, he begins separating the good from the bad in your life. Now, I'm going to make it personal. He begins to separate. This is a great divide, and it is a personal divide. He begins separating the good from the bad in your life. The good, if it's godly good, remains. The bad, if you'll allow him, he'll get rid of it. If you don't, you've just lost him. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. That is a division, friend. He separates. When I got saved, I immediately began to realize that I could not live the life I lived before anymore. Where did that come from? It was a sword coming right down on top of Steve Hill. And the Lord was saying, the drugs, boy, have no part in my body. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Stop putting that poison in. Those cigarettes, son, is killing you. I want to give you long life, but you're going to shorten it. You're poisoning my body. I gave you that body, Hill. Drop the cigarettes. I felt the sword immediately, friend, cutting at me. How many know what I'm talking about? The Bible says anyone who names the name of Christ must depart from iniquity, 2 Timothy 2.19. This has to do with separation. Friends, sin and Jesus, they don't mix. What did Jesus say to the adulterous woman? No, he didn't. He said, go and sin just a little. No, this is what he said. I got the exact translation in front of me. He said, go and try to restrain yourself, but if you fail, that's okay because I understand. These are Bible school students. They're learned. He said, go and sin no more. That's the separation. I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that adulterous woman did not look up at him and say, I wonder what he means. (laughs) Go and sin no more. When Jesus Christ gets a hold of your life, the sin falls away. He came to take away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
The Bible says, he who steals, let him steal no more. The adulterer stops committing adultery. The alcoholic quits drinking. The playboy quits running around. The drug addict throws away the pot, pills, and needles. The pornographer burns his magazines. The witch, the warlock, and the devil worshipers get rid of their pentagrams, their crystal balls, their seance candles, and their incense sticks. The liar quits lying and the thief quits stealing. Friend, Jesus severs sin. Yeah. I'm going to move on in just a second, but some of these are all tied in. The second point is tied into the first. But the first thing the Lord's going to do in your life, friend, is going to set you free from the sin that's damning your soul. This is a great divide. It happened for me on October 28, 1975. The sword came down for the first time in my life. And then consistently, how many knows that the Lord comes down with that sword every now and then? And like, oh, no, you don't. Whap! Out it goes. Thank God for his sword. Sh sharper. Whoo, he knows where he's going with it. The doctors these days think they know something about microsurgery. Boy, the Lord knows how to pinpoint every single disease cell. He can get it out. He can fine-tune that instrument and go in there and go, that one, these, no, not those, that one. It's going out. Sin is anything that Jesus wouldn't do. Sin will destroy you. Sin will satisfy you until it has its claws deep down in your soul. Backslider, listen. Its evil will grip you and it'll rip you up. Sin will take hold of your hand, kiss you on the cheek, whisper empty promises into your love-struck ear, woo you into its bedchamber, lull you to sleep, and then stab you in the back. I used the illustration the other night of going and preaching in a high school, local high school in this area. And I was invited before this revival. I used to go to a lot of high school, secular schools, and speak to all the students. And that used to always amaze me how principals would call up, knowing that I was an evangelist, and say, would you come speak to all the students? It was against the law to do that. But the principals were fed up. They were fed up with the drugs, fed up with the alcoholism. And they let you come in and speak. And the principal came up to me. This is in Mariana High. He came up to me after the service at the school, and he said this, would you please go across the street and talk to all the girls across the street in our pregnant home? This is Mariana High School. And I went across the street. There were some 17 to 25 pregnant girls going through high school. If every one of them had time to tell me the story, you know what it was? It was just what I told you about sin. They were a freshman at the school, and some guy came up loving on them. You know, she just came out of elementary school, sixth grade, and now she's in seventh grade. Or she just came out of ninth grade or eighth grade, and now she's in ninth, just getting into high school. And some guy sees her as just fresh meat, some animal. And here's this innocent girl wanting to grow up in life and keep her virginity, and he comes up wooing her, and he happens to be, in Spanish, we call them guapos. He happens to be handsome, just a real knockout. And he comes up and, and just woos her a little bit, passes her a note and says, you're cute. That's how sin is. Sin will pass you a note. Next thing it'll do, it'll take hold of your hand, and you'll have goose bumbles all up and down. Many of you that have been alcoholics, don't you remember the first drink? How you just sort of felt good. Man, I'll never get heavy into this, but this is nice. I needed to relax a little bit. This is nice. Sin will kiss you on the cheek, whisper empty promises into your love-struck ear. The guy will say to the girl, you're different from all the rest. I really love you. And then you'll turn to him, because you heard some stuff about him, you'll turn to him and say, well, what about the other girls? Oh, listen, I was so immature, but you're... I'm looking for somebody that I can really settle in with and just, I want you to be my girl. I want you to wear my varsity jacket. I want to be seen with you all over campus. I want to tell you, friend, when your belly's protruding out there a half a foot, he ain't around no more. 
Whisper empty promises into your love struck ear, woo you into its bedchamber, lull you to sleep, and then stab you in the back. Sin will promise you everything and leave you with nothing. Sin will promise you heaven on earth and give you eternity in hell. Sin will love you for a season and curse you for eternity. Get it out of your life. Backslider, I'm going to move on. Backslider, listen up. Tonight, you better get a grip on what sin is doing to you. Those of you that are backslidden in this place, at one time you had a relationship with the Lord, but now you've grown cold. And if I could peek into your window at night and listen to what you listen on television and maybe watch that screen for a few seconds, I would fall on my face, grieving as you sit there and you watch a woman take her clothes off but you call yourself a Christian, you're just going through a hard time. You're a little cold right now. You're going through a dry time. So you allow nudity to consume your mind. Then you wonder why you're always filled with lust. Garbage in, garbage out. You'll sit there and allow cursing to come across your home through that 35-inch screen, out those stereo speakers, reverberate off the walls of your house while your little four-year-old kid's playing in the back room with his tinker toys, and you're listening to that garbage, and then you wonder why he comes out saying all those four-letter words. It's sin, friend, and in just a few minutes, you're going to get right with God. You're going to get it out of your life. There's no place for it. Jesus comes. This is a great division. The great divide, he will come and slice it out of your life, and you need to thank God for it. Those of you that want to see God, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. You can't come to him double-minded tonight, wanting a blessing. Don't come up to us wanting us to pray for you that a blessing of God will come down in your life if there's sin there. What hypocrisy. What abomination. What do you think the Lord's looking at? You're asking for an incredible healing anointing and you spend half your life in your mind in bed with other women. Think about it, friend. Well, nobody knows my thought life. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost know all about it. There's always three witnesses. Friend, please understand, we don't come to you tonight. I've never come to this revival crowd. We've been here since Father's Day of 95. I'm not a judgmental man. I don't know if you noticed during the break time, the people that come up, little children will come up and just hug. I love on little kids, love on grandmas and grandpas. People know I care. They know I care. I'm a people person. I'm a, so much of a people person, it's almost killed me before. I've been at such a place of exhaustion because I'm so people oriented. I love people, but I don't want them to go to hell. And I don't want to stand on judgment day one time and you look over at me and say something like this. Oh, so you loved us. You loved me so much, Hill, you wouldn't tell me the truth. You wouldn't confront my adulterous affair. You wouldn't confront my pornography, my alcoholism. So you, so you love me. Thanks for nothing. While the Father says, depart from me, I never knew you. Pastors, don't let that happen to any of your par parishioners. You make sure on that final judgment day, every one of those parishioners, parishioners can look you straight in the face and say, you warned me. You told me the truth, Pastor. Number two tonight, the first one is this, those of you taking notes. When Jesus Christ begins to move, he begins separating the good from the bad in your life, number two. When Jesus Christ begins to move, he separates the believers from the unbelievers. Now, I'm going to get hot. He'll separate the hot from the cold. I read to you last night from the book of Acts 28, 24, when Paul was ending his life. He was in his twilight years. The Bible says, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. What Saul was doing for two years in that town was just dropping the sword daily. Shoo. Some walked in and said, we'll have none of this, left him. Others came in and became disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, some will believe, others won't. I'm sure Paul during that time remembered his speech at Mars Hill. 
The Bible says that some mocked him as he preached on Mars Hill. He spoke about the resurrection, and that bothered everybody. You know, the reason the resurrection bothers people is because everybody can handle a good man. Jesus was a good man. You look at all the religions of the world, basically their teachers were decent people. Everybody can handle that. And they can handle the prophet dying. Especially a, 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 a powerful death like he was martyred or something. They can handle that. But a resurrection, a resurrection means he's alive. And when Paul started talking about that, the Bible says, some mocked him. They sneered, mocked him. These are the three responses to the gospel. Some mocked. Another group of people said this. You know, that's half decent what you're talking about. We want to hear you again on this. We'll see you tomorrow. They hesitated. Tomorrow, friend, is a word only found in a fool's calendar. I wish I could parade those people up here that were on Mars Hill with Paul that day because the Bible says others believed. They went with Paul. The Bible says Paul left. He never went back to Mars Hill. I can see all these folks going back to Mars Hill on the next day going, where's the guy talking about the resurrection of Christ? We're ready to believe. They said, oh, he left with a group of followers. I'm going to tell you, friend, when Jesus begins to move, he separates the believers from the unbelievers. Ask the blind man in John chapter 9. One minute, everything was calm and serene. He had been blind since birth. Everybody could handle that. But now he's running around with a new set of eyeballs. Immediately, he realized what trusting in Jesus would do. Not only was the religious world against him, but even his own family wouldn't take sides with him. Read it for yourself later on in John 9. Even his own family said, he's of age, talk to him. They were all scared. I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ will separate the believers from the unbelievers. And a revival, a move of God, friend, when the heat starts coming up. You watch what happens. You'll have your old saints. And I love those of you that come here. They come by the thousands in their 60s and 70s. I love you folks. I've prayed for more grandmas during this revival than I've ever dreamed of. And they sit there and go, bless God, Brother Steve, pray for me. This is like camp meeting back in the 40s. They make those strange sounds. They go, whoop, whoop, whoop. They go, hop, 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 hop. They'll get up and cut the jig, you know, and listen, grandma's 83. She can do anything she wants when she's touched. But there's some that have grown old and cold old and critical, old and calloused. And then revival comes, and it doesn't come to their camp. It comes to the Episcopalians. He moves mightily among the Southern Baptists. He pours out his spirit in the church across town that you can't stand. And deep down inside, you know it's God, but you're so cold and so callous and so critical. You'd rather simmer in that stew of poison than humble yourself, crawl on your hands and knees, and go over to that church and say, would it be possible, brethren, for you to pray for me because I want a move of God too. See, I've been there, friend. I've done that. I've been delivered. The hole the devil had on me, he ain't got no more. When Jesus Christ begins to move, he'll separate the believer from the unbeliever. I wonder what it was like, those three crosses that day. Remember the thief? 
one on each side of Jesus. Jesus in the middle. He was like the sword right in the middle of the two of them. Matthew records that both of them were cursing Christ. Then Luke records that one of them got saved. Can you imagine that other thief going, wait a minute! Just 37 seconds ago, we were cursing the man together. Now you're going to be with him in paradise? Think about it, friend. They were buddies a few minutes ago. They had everything in common. Then revival hit them crosses. Revival came down. Seven them right down the middle. He will slice away your friendships. He will come and divide your friendships right down the middle. I got people today that won't even look at me no more, friend, that used to be my pals. They won't talk to me no more, friend. But boy, I've got a lot more friends. Woo! This right here is from the Huntsville Times. I was raised in Huntsville, so they talked about this. You know, a long time ago, they used to hate me in Huntsville, but now they're writing about me. I remember a time picking up the Huntsville Times and it says, Major Drug Bust. <laughs> and there my picture would be. <laughs> Sheriff nabs another one, you know. And... Shoo wee. I'm talking about when Jesus comes in, friend, he will separate. He's doing it now. He's going to separate some of you. You're going to get so on fire tonight. You're going to be so on fire, and you're going to go back to Indianapolis. You're going to go back to Waco, wherever you're from, friend. You're going to go back. You're going to go back, and your friends are going to go, what happened to you? We've had pastors, we've had pastors and workers come to this altar down here under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. They had sin in their life. Pastors of great churches, by the way. They've gotten up and done a beeline around this corner and asked one of the ushers, where's the telephone? Where's the telephone? Where's the telephone? I want a telephone now. They get on the phone, they call their honey back out west or up north, and they say, baby, this is what I want you to do. Listen clearly. Open the video cabinet. Take the trash can over there. Get everything in there that has a cuss word, everything that has nudity, everything that is against God, and get rid of it, baby. And the wife says, what has happened to you? It's the sword, friend. The swords come down. But I got this right here. When I got saved, now I was a drug addict for years, okay? I was a scum of the earth. I was a gutter rat, pond slime. I was nothing, okay? I was one of those people where everyone would say, that my family was Mrs. Hill. And my father died when I was 16. They'd go, Marcia, my older sister, my older brother George, my younger sister Susie, and then there's Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Bless his heart. I wonder if he's ever going to get out of trouble. <laughs> they could handle me when I was an addict because I was just a scum, black sheep, you know. Then I got saved. And my sister, this just came out just a couple weeks ago. My sister was interviewed by the Huntsville Times. She said this. The writer says, one of Hill's most staunch supporters is his older sister, who was his biggest skeptic when he first became a Christian. I really thought he was faking it and didn't believe him, she said. We couldn't even have a conversation without him saying, Jesus this and Jesus that. <laughs> I used to say blankety-blank this and blankety-blank that. But now, Marcia would say, how you doing today, Steve? And I usually just cuss, you know light up a cigarette and pull out a beer and drink with her. She'd say, how you doing, Steve? I'd go, 
This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. She said, we couldn't even have a conversation. This is not me talking, friends. This is my sister doing an interview. We couldn't even have a conversation without him saying, Jesus this and Jesus that. I started yelling at him. This is Marcia speaking. And called him every ugly name I could think of. Even though I never used that kind of language. I told him I couldn't even communicate with him anymore. To her surprise, her brother came to her begging and crying for her forgiveness. I remember I asked all my family to cleanse, just wash, just wash everything I've ever done wrong towards them because I'd hurt my family. Only then did she see a genuineness in him. Today, Marcia makes regular visits to her brother's revival with all her family and friends, although she only went the first time out of curiosity. Listen to what she says now. At first, there was a division. I'm talking, friend, a major division. Then she writes this. I had been a Christian all my life, but I didn't actually have a daily walk with the Lord like Steve. I grew up in a conservative Lutheran style of worship. In recent years, I knew I was missing something and I was really hurting. Steve said I just needed to be open to God and that he would take care of things. And she got, man, now she's got a relationship with God, awesome relationship with God. But look what the, the Lord did, friend. He divided my family. I got saved and the sword came down. Get ready for it, friend. I was telling a, a policeman the other day in another town, we were talking about this revival. And I told him that there's people that hate us. And he couldn't imagine that because all he had heard was good about the revival. And he said, what kind of people? I said, there's people that just hate us. And I said, for example, a girl gets saved that's a stripper in a local club and a drug addict. Who hates us? The owner of the club? Hundreds of men that gawk at her every night, that she's their favorite stripper. The drug dealer that makes a fortune off the tips that she makes in the club, she spends it all on drugs so she can sedate herself and dance the next night. There's a web of people around her that hate us. She gets saved, suddenly there's a severance. There's a separation. Jesus Christ, friend, will separate everything. He will separate you from some of your dearest friends, some of you, your own family members. Is anybody listening? Yeah. I'm warning you ahead of time. Some of you girls and guys that are dating, after tonight's service, you will split up. You will split up. Because you're serious, sister, and he's not. Jesus Christ will come along and go, whap. And if you give the Lord a chance, you will find the right man down the road. If you give the Lord a chance, you'll find the right girl down the road. Well, the last point is this. This is the great divide. Number one, I want to make sure you understand this, friend. When Jesus Christ begins to move, he begins separating the good from the bad in your life. Get the sin out tonight. In just a minute, I'm going to give an altar call and you can do just that. Number two, when Jesus Christ begins to move, he separates the believer from the unbeliever. After you get the sin out of your life, you'll automatically see the second one move in. To move in. You'll see automatically once the sin is gone in your life, those of you that were, had friends at work, that love to be around you because you join in with the jokes. Suddenly, you're holy. Have you ever noticed how when you're at a party somewhere, have you ever noticed this, and other people are drinking, how they want you to drink? And you go, no, I'm going to drink a Coke. They go, no, no, have a, have a, have a bourbon and we're on the rocks. No, I'll have a Coke. Have a bourbon. <laughs> I'm just going to have a Sprite. I said, drink this martini. What is that, friend? What is it about sin? What is it? Is, is it like a drowning man that wants as many people to go down with him as he can? Amen. Why is it that sinners are so irritated by holy people? Why is it that a, a Christian can hold his head up high and say, no, I'm a virgin and I'm just saving myself for my marriage partner?
And a man can sit there and cuss you out, say, you prude, you this, you that, and you go, this is so wonderful. I'm in such peace. Oh, that drives people up the wall. It'll separate your friend in a heartbeat. My last point is this. Number three, when Jesus Christ begins to move, he will separate the religious world. They'll either love him or hate him. They'll either say it's God or it's not. I've already read to you how the religious world had received Jesus. Nothing's changed. I thank God for the Nicodemuses. They are out there, friend. Nicodemus, remember what he did? He went to Jesus at night, and he said, listen, listen, I know they're all talking about you back at headquarters, but I know something's up in here. You're, nobody can do what you're doing. God's got to be with you. Talk to me. You must be born again. There's always Nicodemus's friend. But in large, the religious world, when Jesus begins to move, will go into a tailspin. They won't understand this. I love this story right here in the Baptist. But this right here is going to stir more controversy in the Baptist church than they've had in a long time. They're going to get phone calls. They're going to say things like, what do you mean? Putting that article in our conservative newspaper. I've been telling my friends that thing's of the devil for the last two years, and now you had to put it in a magazine. <laughs> it separates, friend. And the religious people come together, and they'll go, it ain't God, it is God, it ain't God, it is God, it ain't God, it is God. Prove to me it's God. My father was saved. My brother was saved. My uncle was saved. My daughter was delivered from drugs. It's God. And then the religious world will look back and go, it'll never last. Who are you, friend? What planet are you from? It'll never last. Who set you up as God's marshal? Who set you up to say, this person. Some of you said that some of the kids in our Bible school would never make it. Ten years from now when they're blazing a trail in South Africa or in China, you'll still be saying, well, it was just deception. After they've already raised up a Bible school in the Far East and have 2,042 converts and people are ablaze with the gospel, planting churches all over, you'll still be dried up in the corner somewhere. Going, well, they're going to fall one day. Friend, they're 72 years old then. They're still living for God. Got saved when they were 18 at the revival. Get a grip. God's on the move. Shoot. You'll hear us say in this revival, we've had over 100,000 decisions for Christ. We've had over 250,000 come to these altars. That's marvelous. And you'll hear people say, well, you shouldn't talk about numbers. Then why don't you take your Bible, open it up, and rip some pages out of it. Why doesn't it say, and a bunch were added to the church that day? It doesn't say that. What does it say? There's numbers in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with that, friend. There's absolutely nothing. Now, it's wrong when you exaggerate. But when you, give under, when you underestimate... And it's not estimation, friend. We're, we're giving under 250,000. 250,000 have come forward. We're saying 100,000. We've got cards coming out our ears, friend. People making decisions for Christ. But this is a religious world that will rise up. I don't believe anybody should have to make a pilgrimage anywhere to get anything from God. Well, tell that to the woman with the issue of blood. And if that's what you believe, friend, then take the sign off your church. And whatever you do, don't put an ad in the, in the yellow pages say, everyone welcome, because you're telling them to make a pilgrimage. And if God's going to move, he can just move in their house, because that's what you're saying. You don't believe in pilgrimages. This is a religious world, friend, and it's a stench. It is a stench. It's hypocrisy. 
I had a man one time talk to me about giving. He got so mad at me. I was planting a church in Argentina. We church plant. A lot of the money that's taken up in this revival goes planting churches all over the world. Tomorrow night's offering is going to go to help plant churches. We take up one offering a week in this revival for our ministry. And this man got so upset at me because I told him I wanted to take him an offering in his church. He goes, no, I don't want my church to have to give to missions. And he said, God will provide for you. And I looked at him and said, God will provide. I said, of course he will. And he's going to use your church. Do you understand me? He goes, no, he ain't. We're not taking up an offering in my church. We don't believe in that. You need to be like George Mueller and just trust God. I said, okay, I will if you will. I will if you will. Why don't you put up a box in the back of your church and whoever just feels like giving can give. Don't ever mention tithing. Don't ever mention offerings. Don't even take them up. Whoever wants to slip a buck in there can slip a buck in there. You know what he said to me? We got bills to pay. My salary comes out of that. We got workers here. We got mortgage payments. I went, mm, sounds like missions to me. Sounds like what we're doing. Friend, I want to tell you, when Jesus comes into the picture, the religious world just gets all stirred up. Shh. Those of you that hate missions, this end time move of God, you're going to see more money pouring into missions than you've ever seen. Get used to it. Get used to it. Shoot. I was talking to Don Wilkerson day before yesterday, and he said, Steve, we got a house down in Columbia. It's going to cost $180,000 for the first Teen Challenge Center in Columbia. And I said, I said, count me in, brother. We're going to build that thing. Got a, got a fax in from Belarus, and they want to build a church in the former Soviet Union, and this is how much the land is going to cost. And I had my, my, my staff email them back and said, count us in, we'll buy the land. And they're pouring in. Why? There's a move of God going on, friend. But the religious world, woo, tightens up. Friend, a true move of God will separate the religious world. Well, I could go on and on about that. One of the things I love so much about this revival, look at me, everybody, is people are having to think about what they believe. They're having to think, did you know there are hundreds of thousands of people in America that call themselves Pentecostals, millions really, that have never had a Pentecostal experience? They don't even know what it is. But all my life I've been in Assembly God Church. All my life I've been in Pentecostal holiness. All my life I've been around. They've never seen a miracle. They've never been used mightily of God. They've never been, been consumed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Friend, this is serious. And what revival does is it brings that to play, brings it all up. The, the, the tide rises, and people have to take a good look. Is that really what I believe? Friend, you better take a grip on it. Take a hold of what you believe. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is coming back? How many believe that? Yeah. Then why don't you live like it? If he's coming back any minute, then how come we're not living like it? We're supposed to be the bride. We're supposed to be anticipating his return. A bride without spot or wrinkle. We believe Jesus is coming back. 80% of North American adults believe that they're going to stand before God on Judgment Day and be held accountable for the sins. They'll say that with one out of one side of their mouth and the other side to be drinking a beer. They'll say, I'm going to stand before God on Judgment Day and be held accountable for my sins. I'm in the other. This is a Gallup poll, by the way. We got these statistics from George Gallup. 84% of Americans, adult Americans, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or God himself. And look at the state of this nation. Friends, something's got to break. Examine yourself tonight. I want everyone to stand up. Those with, you chair, with the chairs, move them to the left and the right, if you would. It's early, but I'm going to give an altar call anyhow. Left and the right. Charity, come on up. Those of you in the cafeteria, I want you to stand. Those of you at home, I want you to get up. Matter of fact, those of you at home, I should have had you stand all the way through the message. That 
chair says it all. Lazy boy. I want everyone to listen up. Those of you moving the chairs, you move them and listen at the same time. Please, no one talking. This message began tonight with a word from the Lord. Church, get ready. You ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. There's a great revival coming. There's going to be a stirring in the church that will boggle your imagination. It will boggle you. People... It's like a pastor said the other day. He stood behind this platform from Pensacola. His church has grown incredibly in this, during this revival. He's from another church in town. But he said, everyone in Pensacola, every pastor has, to, has had to made up, make up their mind. Is that God or is it not? That's what he said behind this pulpit. He said, that we've, all had to, we've all had to make a decision because you can't be on the fence anymore in Pensacola. Either it's God or it's not. And I got a call from out west the other day, and they said, well, what about this certain church in town? What do they believe? And I told the man, I said, they believe absolutely without a shadow of a doubt that this is the devil. They believe it's the devil. They've already made that stand. They've come out publicly with it, that it's not God. I called, the man called me from Dallas, Texas. And the man said, what a shame. It could affect them so positively. I said, yeah, it's a shame, but people have to decide. And you're going to see this in the last days, friend. People are going to have to decide. Are they going to go after God? What do you think an end time awakening is going to look like? What do you think an end time revival is going to look like? Do you think all of a sudden America is going to line up outside your church and your organist is going to start playing? And they're going to all raise their hands and they're going to come to the altar and fall on their face and just begin repenting everywhere? It ain't going to work like that, friend. They've been there. They've done that. They've been there. They've done that, friend. It's going to be a violent revival. Violent. You're going to hear stories. You're going to hear stories and pastors look at me. When the phone calls come from the local principals, I've got a principal waiting on me right now to give him a call. I called him the other day. He wasn't in. Why? Stuff's going on in his school. We get reports from Chicago now. People are falling out in the school. One, one principal called from Kentucky. He said, what am I supposed to do? Kids are being hit by the power in school. This is a secular school. And a superintendent down here, a principal of a school down here, told him he needs to find a room where the kids can just receive from God because it ain't going away. And those of you that think this end time move of God is all about manifestations, you're so deceived. See, while you're in here worshiping God, going after God, enjoying the worship, we have hosts of young people that are not out manifesting. They're not up here shaking and dancing. Maybe you are, but they're not. You know where they're at? They're out street witnessing. They're in the projects. They're on the beaches sharing one-on-one. -on -one. You know, these are the kids that were hit by the power of God 18 months ago. Now they come up crying for the loss of the world. Think about it, friend, and you're all shook up over their shaking. Why don't you go out witnessing with them? Go out into some of the hardcore areas they go to. They've gone into some areas. I've told them, I said, you guys better think about that before you go out at 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night into that dark area of town. They look at me and go, God's with us? I go, yeah, but, you know, they go, hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Go, I'm going, yeah, but man, that's a dangerous area of town. You could get hurt. It'd be for the cause of Christ, wouldn't it, Brother Hill? These kids are serious. They're serious. Right now, I'm going to give this altar call. I want you to listen up. Every one of you that have sin in your life, look this way. Don't be distracted. Everyone look this way. Those of you in the overflow rooms, listen carefully. And those of you at home, there's something in your life between you and Jesus. Perhaps I named it a few minutes ago, pornography, filth on television, adulterous affair, drugs, alcoholism, any of those, friend. Fantasy novels. Ladies, 
That's from the devil himself. Maybe there's something in your life that's keeping you from Jesus. You're backslid in this place. In just a minute, I'm going to open up these altars. You're going to come as quickly as you can. You wait until charity begins to sing. Don't anyone come yet. Backslider, you're going to come quickly. Do not hesitate tonight. Come quickly. It's time to get right with God. Get the sin out of your life. The sword's coming down. You've already felt it. He's coming and he's starting to carve at you. I felt it. You feel it tonight. He's starting to carve that sin out of your life. I just saw a young man. He dropped his head as soon as I looked at him. And the reason for that, friend, is because that's sin. They, he knows it. And I know you're going to come down, brother. I know you will because you want God to work in your life. You're going to come down from the balcony. You're going to come quickly. You're not going to hesitate. Those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, I want you to understand something. He is the King of Kings. The one we meet every night in this church created it all. The other night I was looking out at a, just a, uh, the heavens were just ablaze with stars. It was one of those perfectly clear nights after a rain. And you could see the big dipper, the, the, the little dipper. You could see all the uh, constellations. It was just incredible. And my God, one day just went, Psh. and the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost went, that is so pretty. And I can see Jesus turning to the Father going, did you know that they're going to make telescopes one day to look at those things? And they're never, ever going to be able to find out, Father, how deep and far it goes. They're going to spend their whole life trying to make a telescope big enough. Why don't we just make it a little bit bigger? <laughs> and then, that's who you meet down here, friend. That's who you're going to meet down here, the one who put it all into existence. I remember when we landed on the moon, I believe it was 1969, and one small step for mankind, one small step for man, one large step for mankind. What that must have looked like in heaven. <laughs> Think about it. The moon was a marble, one of God's mar smallest marbles. And he went, just stuck it there and went, you know, it started it spinning, whatever it does, and, and man spends billions. And the world is going, yes, 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 yes. And the world stops, friend. I don't know if you remember it. I remember watching it. What that must have looked like from heaven. They're going, That's the one you're going to meet tonight. Those of you that are into tarot cards, into witchcraft, in, into, into uh, seances, to black magic, all the little emblems, I want you to remember this always, all the little tools like the little tarot cards that you know you flop on the table and you read their, their, their business for the day and you let them know what their marriage is going to be like and you, you read their financial history out there. Did you know that my God made the trees where the paper mills got the materials to make the paper to make your dumb cards. <laughs> the one you're going to meet tonight made the trees that made the cards. You're all into them little cards. Those of you that just love botany and you love studying animals and you just marvel at a hummingbird and the way it, and you spend your whole life trying to understand how a bumblebee flies. Wouldn't it make more sense to get to know the one who made the bumblebee? Yeah. Who knows? Because, you know, they say aerodynamically it's impossible for a bumblebee to fly. Maybe one day the Lord will say, you know what? Bumblebees were so special that we made one angel for every bumblebee. And bumblebees never did fly. We just carried them around. <laughs> And you spent your whole life trying to figure it out. Never did fly. Why are you wasting your life, friend, on all that? 
when you can meet the one who created it all. Jesus Christ came to take away the sin of the world. Your problem is so basic. It's called sin, and he can set you free from it. It's not your marriage. It's not your finances. It's not another job, another car, another house. It's sin, friend. Get it out of your life. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago on Calvary for you, friend. God doesn't have to do one more blessed thing for you. He's done it all. He did it all 2,000 years ago. Now it's time for you to do something. In just a minute, those of you that are away from God, those of you that have never known the Lord, you can come forward. I'm going to hit one more group before we close. This is for those of you that are religious in this room. You're religious. Maybe you're a stoic. You just show, don't show any emotion. Don't forget, Adolf Hitler was a stoic. Don't be so, You're so dry and stale and untouched by God and emotion until you watch a Florida State football game. You ever met people like that, Pastor? I'm just not emotional, Pastor. And then you put them in front of an Alabama-Auburn game. It's amazing. Must be the devil. <laughs> but those of you that are religious, you look right, you walk right, you talk right, you smell right, but you're not right. You don't know the Lord. You don't know him. You can go to hell, friend, with baptismal waters on your face. You can have the form of godliness. You can look, apparently, to everyone. You can look okay. You sing like an angel with the choir, but you're in bed with another man during the week. Nobody knows it. Yes, they do. And it's time to get right. Or maybe you're not into any heavy sin, but you're involved in the church, but you don't know Jesus. And you've always done wonderful things. You're part of the charity drives. You, you take up coats at, for, and, and clothing and toys for toys for tots. And, and maybe, friend, you're, you're involved at Thanksgiving for, and you, you dish out soup in the food line at the rescue mission. You're a wonderful, socially conscious person, but you don't know Jesus. You'll be looking at him on that day and you'll say, but Jesus! My whole life was spent doing this stuff for you. You'll say, depart from me. We never talked. <laughs> I never knew you. You've been rebellious. You've been a lone ranger. You've done everything on your own. We never communicated. I'm asking you, friend, do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Do you know him? Why are these young people getting on fire? Why is that building across the street jam-packed like sardines with young people going after God? They're meeting him. Young people are so sick and tired of dead religion. They're sick and tired of it. They want a relationship. They want to wake up in the morning and say, Good morning, Jesus! I'm going to give this call, everyone who's away from God, everyone who's a backslider, everyone who's never known the Lord, you're going to come. But I'm going to touch on this before you do. Those of you that know you're supposed to be down here and you're not going to come, that's pride, P-R-I-D-E. I just spoke to you at the beginning of this message how God's going to tolerate pride. He's turning from it, friend. He resists the proud. And you're going to see in these last days, the arrogant and the proud, they're going to be severed. They're going to be running around like chickens with their head cut off trying to find God, and he's not going to be anywhere around. Why? Because they're arrogant and proud. And you're saying there, I just can't go forward. What will people think? Who cares? Who cares? You came into this world alone, you leave alone, friend. Ain't nobody going to be by your side on Judgment Day. You'll be by yourself, and you'll be held accountable for April 10th, 1997. What did you do with this altar call? if God gave you the opportunity to repent of your sins. And if you think you're going to go home and take care of business, forget it, friend. The heavens will be brass. I want to tell you they'll be brass. I'm not even stepping out on a limb saying this, friend. This is from the Lord. I don't feel flesh at all in this statement. This is the presence of God, and he's speaking to you. You go home without coming down to this altar. If there's sin in your life, 
Some of you want to go home in the privacy of your own home and get right with God in the secret of your bedroom so nobody can see it. And you're going to get on your knees and you're going to say, Father, Steve was right. That stuff in my life, i got to get it out. i got to get the sin out. Father, Jesus, you'll hear a voice, friend, and this is what he'll say. 2,000 years ago, my son was crucified naked on Mount Calvary for you. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was stripped. He was spat upon. He was cursed for you. Nails were driven through his feet. Nails through his hand for you. He was dropped on a cross, plunged into a hole, and hung on top of Mount Calvary, not behind it, on top of it for you publicly humiliated in front of everyone for you. Most theologians believe he was naked on that cross. And you couldn't walk 25 feet for him. You couldn't walk 75 feet from the balcony for him. You couldn't come up from the cafeteria. You couldn't get up from your lazy boy and get on your knees. Think about it, friend. It doesn't hold up. If you're ashamed of him, the Bible says he'll be ashamed of you. If you'll confess him, he will confess you. Right now, Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Everyone who's away from God, everyone that needs forgiveness, everyone who's never known the Lord, if right now, if you're away from God, if you need him to forgive you, I want you to come, and I want you to hurry right now. I want you to hurry right now. Come on, right now, hurry, hurry. Do not hesitate. Do not wait. Come on down from the balcony now. Come on, hurry, hurry. Let him through. Let him through. In Come on. Darkness, Hurry. Everything Hurry. is unknown. Hurry. I face Hurry. the power Hurry. of Hurry. sin on my Come own. On. Come on. I do not know Hurry. of a place I could go. Come on. Where I Come could on. find a way Come on. to heal my Hurry. wounded soul. Hurry.
I need you on the drum. Lord told me to do something. Every one of you at the altar, do not move.